tracking mode a PLL acts as a filter. To understand this concept, remember that the output of a PLL closely follows an input reference waveform in phase and frequency. So while the input signal is a noisy signal, the output of the PLL is a much cleaner signal with the same characteristics as that of the incoming waveform. So we can say that the PLL rejects noise and acts as a filter. To see that it is a low pass filter, remember that a PLL follows the input variations if the phase deviations are small. But for large phase jumps, it loses the log. Hence, it acts as a low pass filter. And this is the frequency response. It might look that it possesses a very sharp transition bandwidth, but it is drawn on a logarithmic scale. So in this role, the natural frequency omega n is something that can be considered as a measure of the loop bandwidth. This is because frequency is plotted here as normalized by omega n. So we can see when this normalized value is 1, the response is almost flat. And after this value of 1, we have a slope towards the stop band. We conclude that within this almost flat passband region, output roughly follows the input and much of the noise is filtered out. Therefore, a PLL is able to track the phase and frequency variations of an input signal. Now a better definition of a loop bandwidth is needed because we can see here that for the same omega n, the loop response also depends on the damping factor zeta. Zeta is the damping factor which comes from the standard control system and can be explained with the help of an example. So if we drop a tennis ball on the ground, it will come to rest after a few bounces of that ground and the level of those bounces will depend on the surface as well as the material of the tennis ball. Similarly, a phase acquisition behavior depends on the damping factor zeta before it settles into a steady state. Therefore, a loop bandwidth which is called equivalent noise bandwidth as well and sometimes they, these are called loop noise bandwidth is defined such that an actual response of the loop is drawn and an ideal rectangular brick wall filter is drawn as well. And the area of this rectangular filter is the same as the total area under the curve of this loop response. And hence we say that this is the bandwidth of the PLL. It is called equivalent noise bandwidth and given by this formula for a PI loop filter. PLL design starts with choosing the damping factor zeta and the loop noise bandwidth Bn. Now we should keep in mind that a large zeta results in no overshoot, but the convergence time is long because it slowly settles into the equilibrium. On the other hand, I think I should rather redraw this like this. On the other hand, a small zeta exhibits relatively faster convergence, but it has a lot of overshoots. So it exhibits more oscillatory behavior at the start. So a good balance between the two is achieved with zeta equals 1 over square root 2 or 0.7. Any value from 1 over square root 2 to 1.5 or 2 is mostly used. As far as the loop bandwidth Bn is concerned, a small Bn filters out most of the noise and other spectral components. However, we should also keep in mind that any frequency or phase variations that go beyond the, that small bandwidth then our PLL will be unable to track those changes. So it's a balance between filtering out of the noise and the stop band frequencies and the fast phase or frequency variations we are willing to track. A value of around 1 over 100 of the input rate serves as a good starting point. In GNU radio, you will see the values 2 pi over 100 where 2 pi is a normalization factor. Having chosen zeta and bn, now uh, the PLL design comes to choosing the four loop constants. These are the loop filter constants Kp and Ki, proportional and integrator constant, K0 from the an NCO and Kd from the phase error detector. Now in discrete time system K0 is can easily be fixed to 1 and Kd the phase error detector gain comes from the structure and expression of the phase error detector. We will see this in the example later and in the next lectures as well. Uh, the point is that this can be fixed to one. This comes from the actual design of the phase error detector and it all comes down to computing Kp and Ki. So from control system theory, we 
this is something I said before we are not going to derive these things neither are they derived in my book but they are in Michael Rice text with the references given here so if we define theta n in terms of this loop bandwidth and the sample rate then we have kp the proportional component of the loop filter and ki the integral component of the loop filter are given by these equations now they might look complicated but if you have a look at these terms then kd is given by the phase error detector k0 comes from the nco we have already seen those in the last slide and then zeta is something we have chosen as i said before 1 over square root 2 or 1 these are reasonable values theta n comes from here which is a function of bn loop noise bandwidth and zeta so when you plug in these values we get kp and ki in some cases these can be simplified as we will see later so for example in gnu radio there is a block which is called polyphase clock sync so when this is the system is critically damped that means zeta equals 1 now in GNU radio you would have seen something like this alpha is equal to gain beta is equal to gain square over 4 PLL design of the GNU radio documentation so let's see where this comes from when the loop bandwidth is very small we can ignore this factor 2 theta 2 zeta is 10 plus theta omega n square then we can and if this k0 is 1 and the phase error detector gain is normalized we have kp given by 4 zeta theta n so when the zeta equals 1 then we can see that this becomes out to be 4 theta n and ki comes out to be 4 theta n square using exactly the same assumptions then we can write ki equals kp square over 4 so from here what happens is that usually kp is called alpha or gain and then ki equals gain square over 4 this is how these expressions are derived as far as a phase block loop is concerned we cannot implement it in GNU radio companion and the answer is given on the GNU radio page itself so if you go here you will find this in FAQ why can't we do loops a lot of users come into the project looking to experiment including building known algorithms like phase lock loops GNU radio comes with each of the blocks to build your own PLL in a flow graph like a multiplier low pass filter and VCO so all the building blocks are there but you try to put it together and the GNU radio tells you it won't work that the flow graphs don't allow you to do loops why PLL is fundamental to radio and signal processing. How can it be that I can't build loops into a flow graph? The main point is this. You can't perform loops in the flow graph, but you can still do loops in GNU radio. Next explanation is interesting and quite reasonable. Let's first explore why we can't do loops in the way we might want. Data flow between blocks happens in chunks. It does not happen sample by sample. While you may, might want to think of a con continuous stream of samples going through a block, what really happens is a block is passed a large chunk of data from the previous block. A large chunk of data. This block processes the chunk of data in its work function and then passes it on to the next block. Data movement is a costly event and so we want to minimize data movement to focus on data processing. To handle feedback, which is necessary for PLLs, we must only process one sample at a time. Otherwise, the feedback loop won't work. Processing a single sample means maximizing the data movement overhead and is unworkable. So that is why they make their own blocks and you can also make your own blocks and implement a PLL or any feedback algorithm through a for or a while loop. Now we will have a look at the PLL carrier tracking block in GNU Radio and see how difficult this task is. I must say that writing the code is not straightforward but once you get a little hang of it then you know that the main part of the code which relies on the theory is easy to understand and is easy to write once you understand the underlying algorithms for our own radio and signal processing applications. Once we go through this C++ code we find the control loop class. To go to its reference, we find that this is a second order control loop implementation class and for a detailed description, we read this document. 
this class implements a second order control loop as in, in second order control loop so that it can track both the phase and frequency and is intended to act as a parent class to blocks which need a control loop for example costas loop pll ref out pll carrier tracking and so on so it takes in a loop bandwidth as well as a max and min frequency and provides the functions that control the update of the loop the loop works of alpha and beta gains these are the same gains we just discussed in the lecture these gains are calculated using the input loop bandwidth and preset damping factor which obviously can be changed and this is important the class tracks both phase and frequency of a signal based on an error signal the error calculation is unique for each algorithm and is calculated externally and passed to the advanced loop function which uses this to update its phase and frequency estimates so we have an advanced loop function this class also provides the functions phase wrap and frequency limit to easily keep the phase and frequency estimates within our set bounds so we conclude that the pll carrier tracking block inherits this control loop and this is what will be used later in the code after the initialization and housekeeping i will go to the implementation and then we will keep coming back to the relevant function later when it is required so here a phase lock loop is implemented through a for loop which makes sense and let us see what it is doing sine and cos based on this phase are calculated here which are then passed on to the next line here we are derotating the input through this phase that's why we have this negative sign here so this can be thought of in complex terms as y is equals x into e raised power minus j theta and if you do not know about e and j then just remember that the input is being rotated back by our phase estimate in this step phase detector is called here with input and phase let us see what this function is doing the phase detector takes a sample and a reference phase it uses 8 and 2 which computes four quadrant inverse tangent function whose input is the real and imaginary parts of the complex sample and then we simply take the difference between the sample phase and the reference phase mod 2 pi is another function which just makes sure that the phase does not exceed the minus pi to pi limit so if it is greater than pi 2 pi is cancelled from the input and if it is less than pi 2 pi is added to it let's go back advanced loop phase wrap or frequency limit we will go to these functions in the control loop class we just discussed before so advanced loop is what is it doing is that d freak equal d freak plus d beta into error so it is scaling the error through ki the integrator constant and scaling the error with alpha the proportional constant and updating the phase as phase equal phase plus alpha into error plus the frequency part next phase wrap and frequency limits are the functions called here phase wrap just makes sure that if it is greater than 2 pi it subtracts minus 2 pi and if it is less than 2 pi phase wrap keep it within plus minus 2 pi as we saw here finally the frequency limit is a function which if the frequency is greater than max frequency it sets it to the max frequency and if it is less than the min frequency it sets it to the min frequency let us go back after all this has been done and ignoring this part for a moment this code keeps running in a for loop and this is how a phase lock loop is implemented now this is a lock signal where it is taking the i i plus q q part so basically the real part of this operation and scaling it by a factor alpha the previous value is scaled by 1 minus alpha so it sort of keeps a weighted running sum and when this value becomes bigger than some certain threshold as set in the lock detector lock signal is enabled 
So this is it. What I want to emphasize is that while the code looks difficult, once you understand the underlying DSP algorithms, every single step starts making sense. And the only barrier then remains after that is some programming limitations. If you overcome those programming limitations, and once you have understood the DSP algorithms as in this course, I promise you that the actual implementation part is not as difficult as it sounds. And, and certainly you can implement your own signal processing blocks in quite a quick time. Let us take an example of this procedure. So our input is a sinusoid. Output is also a sinusoid. And the loop filter is a proportional plus integrated loop filter while we have an NCO as discussed before. The phase error detector consists of a simple multiplier. Let us see what happens next. These two are multiplied in the phase error detector. So phase error detector output comes out to be sine into cos. So there is a double frequency term and there is a DC term. So A by 2 sine theta En is the term which comes from their difference theta n minus theta hat n. From here we can see that sine theta en for small phase error this is given by theta en and hence we can see we can say that the phase error detector output is a by 2. If you can see it here for small values of theta e this line is approximately straight and we call it say it's a linear region. From here we derive the gain of the phase error detector. Next we choose a damping factor zeta equals 1 over square root 2. We could have chosen another value. And the loop noise bandwidth is 5% of the sample rate. When these values are plugged in Kp and Ki, we get these values which complete our PLR design procedure. Let us see what happens when we plot the signals which are relevant at each stage. Phase error detector output EDN is given by this blue curve and we can see that there is an average component hidden. This red component is the sin a over 2 sine theta en and we have chosen a as 1 and the double frequency term is riding over the average curve. This is the phase error detector output. Let's see what is the loop filter output. So the loop filter if you can see there is not much change in the DC component almost like this but the double frequency term has been substantially reduced. This is because if we see the PLR response then the double frequency term may be lying somewhere over here is substantially reduced as compared to the average component. Next the phase estimate theta hat n if you see follow the same trajectory in terms of the number of samples and the phase error detector output comes to zero after around 70 samples. So it approaches the initial phase of pi after around 70 samples and we can see slightly oscillatory behavior here due to the double frequency term. This was theta hat and the phase estimate. Now these are the input and output sinusoid. They have a phase difference of pi here 180 degrees and with passage of time one sinusoid the output sinusoid is catching up the input reference waveform and around 70 samples they are almost in synchronism with each other.